let me just make two brief comments before we proceed. First of all, uh, one clarification which was raised at the break. I misspoke, uh, and I said that the, uh, the forbidden fruit was the almond, potentially. Um, I got my wires crossed, and that the almond tree was associated in the uh, menorah with the tree of life, which was later forbidden. So it could be that the tree of life is an almond tree. But secondly, in terms of the whole fruit uh, business regarding the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it's not necessarily an apple, but what it might be is that the forbidden tree could have been a fig tree. Anybody remember why or know why we would say that it might have been a fig tree? Well, you've cursed the fig tree, but what is it that Adam and Eve used to cover themselves? Fig leaves. So if they were standing near the tree that they had just eaten from, then that's a good possibility. Or on the flip side, it could just be that it had the biggest leaves. <laughs> Got to cover up. Hey, look at, look at these big leaves. Yeah, I don't know. So just that clarification. Secondly, I just want to read one quotation for you. Um, and it's kind of a nice uh, summarization of everything. It says the following. Um, God produced in Eden a microcosmic version of his cosmic sanctuary. The garden planted there was holy ground with guardianship of its sanctity committed in turn to men and to cherubim. It was the temple garden of God, the place chosen uh, by the Spirit who hovered over creation from the beginning to be the focal site of his throne among men. By virtue of his uh, presence, Eden had the character of a holy tabernacle, a microcosmic house of God. And since it was God himself who present in his glory constituted the Edenic temple, man in the garden could quite literally confess that Yahweh was his refuge and the Most High was his habitation. And one, one you know, point to note on that before we get on to the next subject here, which is the work of the first Adam, uh, is the idea that uh, it's not just simply a few scattered commentators that identify uh, the garden as the first temple. You find it in Jewish rabbinic interpreters. You find it in conservative commentators, reformed folks. You find it in huge big time liberals. So anytime you get liberals, conservatives, you know, Jewish rabbinic interpreters, and, and all these different sorts of people to agree on something, that, yeah, it's a miracle, right? Yeah, it's either a miracle or maybe it's just a quirk and it's just a weird quirk or chances are maybe that's where the truth lies, chances are. You know, I'm not saying that it's that with, that with absolute certainty, but it certainly does make you, you know, take notice and say, well, that's an interesting fact. All right. Well, uh, keeping that in mind in terms of the garden as the first temple. <coughs> Sorry, that didn't work. <laughs> I was going to try to shield it, but it, I, I guess I'll just have to, I'll flip the switch next time. That only made it worse. Um, what we want to talk about is we want to talk about Adam's labors in particular. What exactly was Adam tasked to do? And I think that what this is particularly connected to, at least in, in classic Reformed theology, is the subject of what's called the covenant of works. The covenant of works. So before we begin to look specifically at Adam's uh, you know, work and his responsibilities, what I'd like us to do is explore uh, what a covenant is to begin with uh, so that we have an understanding. So we want to, first of all, define what a covenant is. Secondly, we want to explore the evidence for the existence of a covenant uh, in Genesis 1 through 3 and then in the broader canon itself. Third, we want to explore uh, the nature of of Adam's work, and what is it specifically he was required to do. So let's look first of all at defining a covenant. I think that this is not necessarily a very difficult idea, and that we can say at its most fundamental level, uh, a covenant is an agreement between two or more parties. Simply an agreement between two or more parties. And when we look at the Bible, 
in its ancient Near Eastern context, uh, there were, uh, and we would say that this was roughly around the 15th century BC, 15th century BC, is that you had uh, a number of cultures around uh, the, uh, you know, the Israelites uh, at this point, who they too made agreements. They made covenants. And there were uh, six typical features that you would find in these types of agreements or these types of covenants. Now this is not to say that every single covenant has all six of these features. Uh, this is not to say that um, we're gonna use extra biblical uh, uh, you know, information and impose it upon the scriptures. No, but what we're gonna say is, is that if this was the way, for lack of a better term, that business was conducted in the ancient Near East, and if this is the way that agreements were made, covenants were made in the ancient Near East, and then we can find these same types of features in biblical covenants, then this shows us, I think, to a certain extent that where a covenant exists, how we can identify it, what are its features. Okay? So the first of all is that uh, you know, uh, these covenants in the ancient Near Eastern context usually began <clears throat> with an introduction of the participants. Who were the parties to this agreement? Introduction of the participants. Uh, secondly, there is a historical prologue reviewing past relationships. In other words, what has been the history between our two parties? Did we just meet? Have we had any other agreements between us? Have we had any other covenantal arrangements between us? Thirdly, there were typically stipulations. What is it? that we're required to do in this agreement. What are you going to do? What am I going to do? So an introduction of the participants, a historical prologue reviewing past relationships. Thirdly, uh, the, uh, the stipulations of the, agree of the agreement. Fourthly, uh, the preservation of the agreement or the covenant uh, in a temple, in a temple with the requirement of its regular reading. Fifthly, blessings and curses. If you keep it, this will happen and this will be a blessing upon you. If you don't keep it, this curse will happen upon you. And then sixthly, a list of witnesses to the covenant. And in some of these uh, you know, ideas, they're ideas that continue on in our own day when we make business agreements. You know, what's going to happen if you keep the agreement? Well, you obtain the property. Well, what happens if you violate the agreement? You're going to be sued. You're going to be cursed. Um, so, introduction of the participants, historical prologue reviewing past relationships, stipulations, the requirements of it, preservation of the covenant uh, in a temple with its regular reading, blessings and curses, and a list of witnesses to the covenant. Now, what's interesting is on the broad scale... That's what we find in the first five books of the Bible. That um, God introduces himself in the opening chapter. I created everything. Uh, you have the historical prologue in terms of past relationships because all of this material is originating right at the time of the Exodus so that God is saying, I'm the father of who? I'm the God of your father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Who shall I say sent me? Tell them the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob sent you. So God is rehearsing his past relationships with the Israelites. There are certainly stipulations. Here are the requirements, and this is what you have to do in order to maintain the, uh, you know, the uh, requirements of this agreement. You have the preservation of the reading of the covenant and its preservation in a temple. Where is the covenant supposed to be kept? Where is it supposed to be kept? In the ark, in the covenant. Uh, ark of the covenant into the, uh, the tabernacle and later on into the temple. And certainly they were supposed to regularly read it and know it. The king, for example, was supposed to keep a copy of the law for himself. Um, there are certainly blessings and curses... If you keep this, 
You know, your land will be fruitful. Uh, You will have many children. Your enemies will flee from before you. But if you do not keep this, you will be cursed. You will eventually be exiled. The the sky will turn hard. It will not rain on you. Uh, You will have famine. You will have disease and all kinds of other bad things. So at least on the broad scale, we can see that this is the characteristic and these are the characteristics that mark Israel's relationship with God, one that is covenantal. All right? Now, more broadly, we can also observe that there are all kinds of different covenants in the Bible. There are covenants that exist between two human beings or between uh, people, friendship covenants, Think of the friendship covenant between David and Jonathan in 1 Samuel chapter 18. They, we have what's called a parity covenant. A parity covenant is when two equals make an agreement. What you see between Abraham and Abimelech in Genesis chapter 21. You also have what is known as a suzerain vassal covenant. The suzerain is a fancy word for lord. Vassal is a fancy word for servant. Lord and servant. A superior making a covenant with an inferior. Uh, And you see this uh, in in Joshua chapter 9 when the Israelites subject the inhabitants of the land and say, okay, we'll make this, we won't destroy you which is something they weren't supposed to do to begin with, but we'll, it's, I always like this, theological hand grenade, <laughs> throw it out there and run away. Uh, we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> now, I may throw a few more grenades later on. We'll see. <clears throat> um, marriage is also described as a covenant uh, in Malachi chapter 2. Those are the different types of covenant, uh, covenantal arrangements that, that we can have between people. There are also covenants, obviously, in the Bible between God and his people. Uh, there is the Noahic covenant, broadly, uh, between God and man and in the entire creation. There's the Abrahamic covenant, in Genesis chapter 17, for example. The Mosaic covenant covenant that God makes with Israel through Moses. There's the Davidic covenant, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 8 through 17. So those are the different types of covenants that we see here. So that's just a very uh, broad uh, survey, very quick one, uh, about the nature of covenants in the Bible. So that then gives us some information, a few hooks, if you will, on which we can hang our hats. Uh, to ask the question, do we see any type of covenantal activity in the Genesis narrative? Now, this is where it's important that we have to not only look at the Genesis narrative itself, but also at the broader Old Testament to see if the Old Testament gives us any information about what's going on in Genesis 1 through 3. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 5, we see the creation of the, the, the heavens and the earth. And that statement in and of itself doesn't immediately indicate to us that it's covenantal activity. But later on in the Old Testament, the Old Testament identifies it as covenantal activity on God's behalf or on God's part. In Jeremiah chapter 33, Jeremiah chapter 33, verses 20 and 21, thus says the Lord, if you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night so that Day and night will not come at their appointed time. Then also my covenant with David, my servant, may be broken. So that's in uh, Jeremiah 33, verses 20 and 21. So here God describes his creation of day and night as covenantal. And as unbreakable as that covenant is, so is God's covenant with David unbreakable. So that every morning we get up, we know the sun is going to come up and the sun will set because of God's covenant that he made, essentially with himself in and through the creation. We know that whenever God issues, I think we can almost say this, is that um, when God speaks and he binds us to something, that he is issuing forth covenantal binding arrangements. And he does this, for example, when he places um, 
blessings and sanctions upon us, blessings and curses upon us. We know that for certain, the blessings and curses, which is a feature of a covenant in the ancient Near East, we know that it is a feature of the Mosaic Covenant. Do we see blessings and curses in the Genesis narrative? Yeah, you can do this like this. Yes. Or you can say no if you want to. You can say, no, I'm not, I don't believe what this guy's saying. I don't like him, and I, I, you know, I, I, I'm not going to say that. I, I think he's wrong. Um, yeah, there are blessings and curses. Ostensibly, it's not stated explicitly, but if Adam was to have obeyed, what would he have had access to? Tree of life. And then we know for certain that he does not obey. He takes from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and he eats of it, which God said, if you eat from this tree, what would happen to him? He's going to die. In fact, they're that same blessing and curse arrangement, they say, is the same type of blessing and cursing arrangement that we find in the Mosaic Covenant. So there's that feature. There's that feature. Um, one of the other attending characteristics of a covenant is that when God makes a covenant with his people, he invariably attaches signs visible signs to those covenants as kind of seals, if you will, like the seal, an official seal on an official document. It's like John Calvin said that you know that a document has authority if it is sealed with an authoritative stamp. So that as we can back into this, um, God makes his new covenant through Christ and gives us the signs of baptism and of the Lord's Supper. These are seals. Uh, the Apostle Paul, for example, calls circumcision a seal and a sign of the righteousness that Abraham had by faith. But we know from uh, Genesis chapter 17 that circumcision is a sign of God's covenant with Abraham. It's one where I'm sure that Abraham would have said, Excuse me, what was that? The circumcision, uh, okay, I just, just want to be sure on that one. Um, what other sign of a covenant can you think of? Rainbow. Yeah, the rainbow. There's the rainbow. This is the sign of my covenant. There's another sign in the Mosaic covenant in Exodus 33, is that he says, my Sabbath will be a sign of my covenant to you that I'm making with you. Now you say, well, how can a period of time uh, be a sign? Well, if you think of it this way, that as people would cease from their labors and all of the activity in the land would come to a standstill and instead the people of God would worship uh, the one true living God, that would be a visual sign to the surrounding nations around it that God was indeed in their midst. So here we see all of these attending signs. Well, what theologians have said about the past is uh, about the Garden of Eden is that in the Garden of Eden, you had some signs. How so? Well, uh, when you have, uh, you know, some commentators have said, well, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil must have had poison in it. And the tree of life must have had some sort of life-giving substance in it. I think, well, I don't think so. I don't think that it was the fruit per se, from one of those, either of those trees. What was the big problem with eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Was it the fruit itself? Disobedience. Disobedience. That's the poison. That's right. Yeah, the, the tree is merely a sign for God's command. You have to obey me. And then the same thing with the tree of life. It's not that the tree itself is somehow uh, magically uh, infused with some sort of life-giving substance, but rather it is the promise of God that stands behind it. So that theologians have said about the trees of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life, that these are signs of the covenant. That these are signs of the covenant. When we look at... So at least if we stop and make the comment here to this point to say that we can say, therefore, that there are a number of indicators 
in the Genesis narrative itself, Genesis 1 through 3, that there is covenantal activity uh, between God and man. Just because it is not explicitly mentioned does not mean that it's not there. There's some theologians that will say, well, no, Gen- the covenant term does not appear until Genesis 6.18. That means covenant uh, it does not exist prior to Genesis 6.18. I want to say, well, wait a minute. You have Jeremiah identifying the creation of the day and night as covenantal activity. We know that Adam and Eve had what kind of relationship? Marriage, husband and wife. And Malachi identifies that relationship as a covenantal relationship. So just because the Genesis narrative itself doesn't specify the term doesn't mean that it's not there. We have to ask and can ask the question substantively, materially, uh, do we find the ideas uh, that indicate that there was a covenant present there in the opening chapters? And so far, I think we can say, yes, there are those, those, those uh, indicators that, that it is there. But what about the rest of the canon of Scripture? Yeah, I, I pulled that one off flawlessly. Um, In the sixth chapter of Hosea, we find a particular verse. Hosea chapter 6, verse 7. And this is an interesting uh, verse. It says, uh, and it's been translated one of two ways. And actually, a a few more ways, but two chief ways for what we're considering. But like man, they transgressed the covenant. There they dealt faithlessly with me. Or an alternative translation is, but like Adam... They, Israel, transgressed the covenant there. They dealt faithlessly with me. Well, there are a number of translations that render this, but like Adam. The RSV, the NRSV, the NAS, the ASV, the ESV, and the NIV, and the Vulgate, for what it's worth, all translate it as, as Adam. Um, Warfield, Luther, Turretin, Abrakel, Vitzius, uh, Kyle and Dalich, uh, A. A. Hodge, Voss, and the Westminster Confession in its 1789 revisions, they all uh, render that Hosea 6-7 verse as like Adam. Now, what's the significance here? Well, here what Hosea is doing is he is leveling a charge against Israel. Leveling a charge against Israel. And he's saying, you have violated the covenant that God made with you. And so the question is, is to whom is the prophet comparing them? Is the prophet comparing them to man in general? But like man, they transgress the covenant? And that is a possible reading. Or on the other hand, is he comparing them to Adam, where God established them in a land flowing with milk and honey, where he provided for their every need, where he protected them from their enemies. But he told them, in order to remain in the land, you must obey me. So is the comparison between not man in general, but to Adam in specific? And I think that that is the nature of the comparison. Now, that's not absolute proof positive that Adam is in covenant uh, with, um, you know, with, uh, with God, but I think that it's certainly an important connection to that effect. But we wouldn't want to say that it hinges upon that one verse alone. You could move and take that verse out of the equation, and I think that the argument would still stand, especially when we look at other portions of the scriptures. Say, for example, chiefly, chiefly in Romans chapter 5, where Paul contrasts the actions of Adam and Christ. Now, here is where I like to bring in some really, really technical stuff that I call Sesame Street theology. Uh, For those of you who grew up on the street, Sesame Street, you are going to be familiar with this. For those of you who have not, well, my apologies. Shame on you for not watching. 
Um, but there was this little thing that I used to remember as a kid. You'd have three policemen on the screen and one fireman. And then they would sing the song, which one of these things is not like the other? Can you tell me which one it is? And you're supposed to say, the fireman is out of place. Well, here's the question. We can't hardly walk a step without bumping into a covenant in the Bible. They're all over the place. You can't throw a rock in the Bible without hitting a covenant. Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant. Israel is in covenant with God. Abraham is in covenant with God. Noah and the creation is in covenant with God. David is in covenant with God. There are covenants all over the place. So I want to say, you mean to tell me that this little patch called Genesis 1 through 3 is unlike every other patch in the Bible, that there's no covenant there when there are covenants all over the place? Which one of these things is not like the other? Can you tell me which one it is? Or would we say that the very comparison that Paul is drawing between Adam and Christ is he is, without using the word itself, talking about the fact that just as Christ is the covenantal and federal head of his people, so Adam is the covenantal federal head of all of those who are in him. And just as his one act of disobedience is accredited and is imputed to all of those whom he represents, so Christ's one act of righteousness is imputed to all of those for whom Christ is representative. And if this means that just as in Adam all die, then that means that all who are in Christ live. And just as the one act of a disobedience brought condemnation and death, so the one act of righteousness brings justification and eternal life. In other words, you have these two representative heads. There are no other two places in all of redemptive history to stand. We are all covenantally uh, in, uh, joined to one of these two men. We cannot say, I'm not with Adam. I wasn't in the garden. You can't hold me responsible for what he did. I would have invented a chainsaw and cut down the tree of knowledge. But the same thing holds true is that if you don't want to take credit for what Adam did, then neither can you have the credit for what Christ did either. And there's some theologians that basically say, and and one of them, there are many things that I disagree with on, but I find this statement to be incredibly, uh, you know, true true and insightful, is he says, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, uh, we are all in covenant. We're either in covenant with Adam or in covenant with Christ. There is no neutral ground on which to stand. And so here you have Paul contrasting these two federal heads. And federal heads are covenanted heads so that their actions are representative of those who are united to them or are representative uh, or who, are, uh, who they represent. Okay, so you know, here uh, we have uh, those, uh, those elements here. So long story short, I think we can say that Adam... Is, a covenant, is, is in a covenantal relationship with God. Because he's got the covenant signs. If you obey, here's the sign of that obedience, the tree of life. If you disobey, this is my law that I'm giving to you. Here's the sign of that uh, in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, he is um, given blessings and curses. If you obey, you will live If you disobey and you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then in that day you will surely die. Uh, When God creates, he's creating covenantally. And when Adam disobeys, he's not just bringing a curse upon himself, but also upon his offspring. In other words, he is a representative. So these factors, as well as these other elements in the Genesis narrative, I think lead us to the conclusion that Adam was in covenant with God. Now, if that is 
the covenant that Adam has with God, then the specific question comes up is, is what is the work of that covenant? What responsibilities does Adam have? What responsibilities does Adam have? And so for that, let's look at uh, you know, the opening chapter of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 1. In that I think we don't uh, look at Adam so much as having work per se. I mean, generally, we know that he's supposed to tend and keep the garden, and so we think, well, that was his work. But there's actually more. So here we see in Genesis 1.28, and God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. That chiefly is Adam's work. That is Adam's work. First and foremost, he was to be fruitful. He was to be fruitful. Now, here's the interesting fact about all of this. I mean, there's more interesting stuff here, obviously, but I guess this is the thing that comes to my mind, is that we look at this frequently sim simply in terms of procreation. I mean, they were supposed to be fruitful and multiply. Okay, fine, fair enough, procreation. But... I think that there's an, a, a significant dimension to this. In what way? Well, in the ancient Near East, when a king would go in and conquer a land, he would go in and conquer a land. The next thing that he would do is he would build a temple, and in that temple, he would set up his image. And it was his way of saying... I own this. This belongs to me. If that's the nature of how the, the language, if you will, the conveying of sovereignty worked, then do you begin to see what God is communicating uh, to the world around him by building this temple in the first garden, creating man in his image, and setting up his image in the garden? He's saying, it's mine. I own it. I'm sovereign over it. But by extension, what is the implication if Adam is supposed to be fruitful and multiply? I think we often think that Adam's existence in the garden was kind of like the Bahamas. Just supposed to sit back with his, you know, little, little, umbrella drink, and just bask. Now, I'm sure that he would have had times of rest, without, without doubt. But he wasn't just supposed to stay in the garden. Because if they were fruitful and multiplied, what would have happened in the garden? Yeah, they would have gotten kind of cramped. Yeah, can you move over? <laughs> this is the getting, you know, go outside the garden. Uh, you know, this is getting a little bit crowded in here. But what's significant? The people that Adam and Eve would have generated by procreation, what is it that they bear? God's image. And you see that later on in Genesis chapter 5. Um, in Genesis chapter 5, this is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them, and he blessed them, and he named them man when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. The implication here is, is that Adam is created in the image and likeness of God, and since his son is born and bears his image and likeness, he too bears the image of God. Now, we're going to make this connection later on after the lunch break, but do you see how sonship and image bearing are so closely connected? That Jesus is God's son and is the image of God. And in this sense, we can say, and we'll see this later on, that the Bible calls Adam God's son. Luke 3.38. But here's the idea. 
Adam is supposed to be fruitful and he's supposed to multiply. He is supposed to, with Eve, produce these image bearers. But as they were to grow and increase, they would inevitably have to spread out. And as they spread out, the image of God is starting to fill up the creation. And it's not just a question of filling up the creation. If God plants uh, his, his image around and is saying, I am sovereign over this, the more that his image spreads around the earth, what is the implication? That God is sovereign over the whole creation. And notice how being fruitful is connected with what other activity? Be fruitful and multiply. Have dominion. Subdue the earth. In other words, if Adam is given the responsibility to, to, to subdue the earth, that means that the earth at that point in the narrative is what? In need of subduing, unsubdued. In other words, I think again, when we think about the Garden of Eden, we think, well, that must have been what the whole world was like. No, it's just the garden uh, was, had this order to it. And so notice how this begins to mirror God's activity in the creation. God creates, and when he creates, it's tohu vabohu. That's the Hebrew, and I like saying it because it makes me sound smart. No. Um, we're going to pick up on that language later on. Tohu vabohu, but it's empty uh, and it's without form. It's formless and void. Formless and void. So he creates it, but it needs ordering. And so when he creates it, he then does what? He orders it. He creates these realms, and then he fills these realms with creatures and people. Well, so just like God, uh, uh, Adam was supposed to extend the order of the garden the order of the temple throughout the creation, and he was supposed to fill the earth with these divine image bearers. In a sense, in an essence, claim the entirety of the creation, the entirety of the creation for the creator. Now, I'm getting ahead of myself, but again, I can't, I can't contain my enthusiasm. Uh, when you get to the end of the Bible and the new Jerusalem descends and it's the size of the known world at that time, you know, uh, so many thousand, 1,500 stadia by 1,500 stadia by 1,500 stadia, that was the size of the known world and this heavenly city descends out of it and it's filled with image bearers. I'm still getting ahead of myself, but... God doesn't change the work. He instead sends somebody who will faithfully complete it. But nevertheless, going back, you begin to see the significance here of the work. Adam and Eve are supposed to multiply and be fruitful. They're supposed to subdue the earth and fill it with these divine image bearers. Now, here's the thing that we have to keep in mind, and here's where recognizing this as the temple and the nature of the work, uh, I think, begins to slightly shift our understanding of this work, is that I think that we often come to this passage of Scripture <clears throat> thinking that here's the work, we're supposed to tend and keep the garden, therefore, Work is good because work exists before the fall. Therefore, now as redeemed Christians, we're supposed to continue to work uh, and we're just supposed to carry on our labors and that this is ultimately in fulfilling Genesis 128. Um, we should have lots of children. Now, I don't want to speak against anybody who has large, large, a number, large number of children. I was telling Stan, Pastor Stan here, um, you know, I always say that, you know, I've got two boys, they're two and a half and five, um, and sometimes, I, you know, I frequently will tell my wife, I've really enjoyed the weekend with you and the boys, but uh, I'm going back to work to rest. 
Um, you know, I, I, need some, I need some peace and quiet. I need, this, I need the sanctuary of my holy of holies in my office. Um, and then I always think like I'm such a marshmallow uh, because, uh, you know, I've only got two. <laughs> and there's some people out there that have five, six kids, and they just seem to be doing fine. I think, okay, I'm a pansy, I'm a lightweight. Um, but what we have to ask is, is that can we appeal to Genesis 128 and just hopscotch over the fall as if it never happened? Can we simply say, well, we have to do the work of the dominion mandate? And this is where I want to always ask this question. And it seems simple, but I think it's, it's, it, it can really change the nature we understand this, is that, well, what about Jesus? How does Jesus change how we understand this work? Not so much in terms of the work itself, but rather in terms of what difference does Jesus make? What difference does the fall make? Now, I'm going to fill in the details later, but just because I hate waiting. I hate waiting. Uh, if you ever were to come to my house, you would never want to watch um, movies with my wife and me. You would never want to celebrate Christmas with my wife and me. Because um, we just open gifts all the time. You want to open up a gift? Yeah, let's open up a gift. I hate waiting. <laughs> um, you know, my wife and I will be watching a movie and we'll be like, ah, I can't stand the tension. Break out the iPhone, get the Wikipedia up, and let's find out what happens. <laughs> Cannot wait to the end. And then we'll be like, all right, good. Okay, we know what's going to happen. But we just can't stand the tension. Uh, you know, so in that sense, when we go to a real movie theater, it's, it's torture on us. It's like, oh, we've got to find out what's going to happen here. This is what happens, is that it's not that God changes the work. He instead sends somebody faithfully to execute it, so that Christ takes up the failed work of the first Adam, and it's ultimately fulfilled in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the Great Commission. Now, we'll fill in those details later, but the b big thing that I want you to grasp from the nature of Adam's work is that notice its global extent. He was supposed to fill the earth. He was supposed to subdue the earth. And this, I think, is connected to the Great Commission. And again, I'll fill in the details later, but... When Christ says, all authority in heaven and earth have been given to me, go ye therefore into all the nations. So the work is not just simply, I'm going to go to work today and I'm going to fulfill the dominion mandate. The work is not, I think we need to have lots of children and that way we can fulfill the dominion mandate. But rather, the work is, is how do I as a member of the church of Jesus Christ, the last Eve, if you will, assist the last Adam in carrying out the work of the Great Commission. So that the degree to which we participate in seeing to the completion and the fulfillment of the Great Commission is the degree to which we are carrying out the failed work that Adam did not do, but we do through Christ and the propagation of the gospel. Um, because what we have uh, is in the pre-fall context, we have the combination of cultural endeavors put together with holy endeavors because there's no sin in the world. But with the sin, you find a breaking of these two apart so that our cultural endeavors are not necessarily the same thing as the holy work that we have in the Great Commission. Case in point, uh, when you see metallurgy invented, 
when you see music created, when you see great architecture in the cities created, do you remember what line that's associated with? The line of Cain. So that you can have all of these things and they're not necessarily promoting the original work that God gave to Adam. That doesn't mean that they're in an inherently in any way bad in and of themselves. But it's just that they are now distinct from that holy labor that is taken up by Christ. Which means that in the end, and we'll talk about this later, is that the means by which we carry out the dominion mandate as it is taken up by Christ is the means that God appoints in Christ through the gospel. Which means that that work is now carried out not just simply through subduing, not just simply through extending geographic space and reproduction, but rather it's extended through the preaching of the gospel, the, 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 the propagation of the gospel throughout the world. Now, these are pieces of the puzzle that we'll pick up in greater detail, but it's important simply to recognize this, and we'll look at this as well in, in greater detail, is that Adam is the first prophet, priest, and king. Adam is the first prophet, priest, and king, and he is given this holy labor to take up in God's temple to extend this temple uh, throughout the entire world. He is God's vice regent, his, uh, you know, his sub-manager, if you will, his manager of his, of his land. And so then, God doesn't change the vocation, but rather instead sends someone who will faithfully execute it. Okay? Now, in the next lecture, what we're going to pick up is we're going to pick up uh, with shadows, uh, shadows and types, shadows and types of the last Adam. In other words, what happens in redemptive history is that God does not go straight from the fall immediately to the advent of Christ. What God does, and this is my way that I like to characterize it, is he whispers throughout redemptive history with increasing volume, this is what it's going to look like. This is what my son is going to look like. This is what my son is going to look like. This is what my son is going to look like until we get to that, uh, you know, literally earth-shattering declaration at the baptism of Christ. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. And when you see that revelation and that acknowledgement of Jesus, all of a sudden, all of these other previous anticipatory manifestations uh, revelations of what Christ was going to look like all of a sudden makes sense. And when we get to the, the last lecture and we put all the pieces of the puzzle together, I think you're going to go, holy cow, I knew this all along. I can't believe I didn't see it before. And that I was telling the men last night at dinner, I said, we read the Gospels many times and we think, for pity's sake, why doesn't Jesus just come out and say, I am God in the flesh. I am eternal. Now, at certain points, he does. But all of a sudden, in light of everything that's gone past in the Old Testament, Jesus is basically saying, you're looking at him. Uh, you know, the way I like to describe it is Jesus is wearing his coat of many colors, but his coat of many colors consists of all of these Old Testament images and passages so that when you read this, you're like, of course. Jesus is screaming it from the rooftops that God in the flesh is finally here. The fulfillment of all of these things. And it comes in this key. And now I'm getting ahead of myself because I'm starting to give away stuff from the sermon, which is not even today. <laughs> but does anybody, can anybody remember what Jesus' favorite title for himself is? <laughs> Son of man. Where does that title appear? You know where that appears? Ezekiel, Ezekiel, Daniel 7, Psalm 8. Psalm 8, which is used to describe the creation. What is the Son of Man that you are mindful of him? You have set him over the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea. So that when Jesus comes on scene saying, the Son of Man, he's basically saying, remember that first guy? That's me. Except I'm going to put 
right what he messed up. He's basically screaming it. I am the last Adam. It's just that if you're not dialed into the right frequency to all of these Old Testament images, it's just going to go over your head. But hopefully we can fill that out and uh, we can learn a little bit more. So that that'll, that'll takes us to this break. We've got another break here until 11.15, which we're ending a few minutes early. And so Stan here has uh, some uh, announcements and then we'll go ahead and take the break.